Thank you for having me. I'm going to invite some students on the stage because we're in the performing arts and we just put on a show. All right. Any opportunity to do so, we'll do so. Uh, so you can join me. Uh, we got some folders because we are visual people and we also have a PowerPoint. Um, there we go. Great. So they're they are working on it. Uh, in the meantime, let me tell you something. Um, uh, right now, I hold an office at the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival. Uh, the organization was founded in 1969. It has about 600 colleges that are participating in the festivals across the regions, across the country, and about 18,000 students. What is important about it is that we have in every region scholars from other colleges and uh, practicing professionals that are in the industry and belong to the different unions come in and critique our work. UMass Boston is one of the colleges that is actually participating in that. It's great for outcome assessment and many other things. Uh, what's important to me is that uh, it's being a place where I can do research. I'm really, really concerned about the state of the arts in our country, especially theater arts. Storytelling, I think, is really important to promote our culture. Uh, but I'm also interested in what's happening across the country and how we're helping the young students to go from the school to a, a choice internship or working, uh, a working paid internship uh, or a grad school of their choice, et cetera. Um, so I presented this actually at a different venue with about 4,000 people last spring. And I thought, what happens if I take the theory and I actually bring it home to UMass? And let's see, what is the state of the arts here? What are we doing with our students? in our small but very exciting and very strong program. So that's what I want to share with you about. Next slide. Great. So I met a lot of students. And I'm telling you, I'm crazy about UMass students because they have grit. And I know people use that word. I was using it way before it was a buzzword. OK? Uh, they are pretty strong. They are hungry. They keep me humble. They keep me going. I want to do more. I worked at various uh, private institutions. Uh, before this, I have nothing bad to say about them, but I think it was time for me to come to UMass. I wanted to feel home. Uh, I've been here for two semesters and a few weeks, and the honeymoon is on, <laughs> okay? And I intend to keep it that way. Uh, so when I meet students, you know, and parents, because I talk to parents too, I, I worry, you know, about the arts. They ask me, these are the, there's like a thousand questions, but there are three that are key to me that I always get. They ask me, what is the path to value your apprenticeships? Sometimes they say, am I going to get a good internship? Uh, they ask me, do I need a resume and portfolio? They also ask me, can I get a paying job or is that a hobby? Parents especially say, are they going to make any money? <laughs> right? So I can give them my answer, right? Because I'm in the business of higher education and I worked at private colleges before, so the answer was, sure, bring them in. But I actually care, you understand? I want them to succeed. A, I want to retire. <laughs> you know, but B, I, I want theater arts to be alive. I want our story to tell our stories. I mean, there are new plays about the war in Iraq. There are new plays about the use of the veil in our country. There are all these topics, at Proposition 8. There are new plays out there. We need to tell those stories to keep the dialogue and the dec dem democracy alive in our country and then take it to a, a road around the world. But I digress. Next slide. So the first question, what's the path to value and printing ships? Um, I do have an accent, and when I get excited, I can get a little thick, so I'm going to remember to articulate like we do in the theater and smile. So, um, so um, this is the theory that I came up with by doing the research. Next slide. Um, there are different things you have to look at, and it begins in the classroom, like in any other field. Um, you want to have a clear curricular vision and mission, right? My mission is not to get the $56,000 a year from the students so they can pay my salary. <laughs> I'm speaking about a different college, you know. Um, uh, my mission is, do they have the balls to do this? Do they have the grit, the commitment to do theater? Because it's hard work, you know. And if they want to do it, I'm going to root for them. You understand? So that's one mission. But the department also has a vision and a mission, our department of performing arts, that I believe in. Um, the other thing is looking at industry standards and best practices. Because I may have a philosophy about theater that has to do with the 1970s in Venezuela, where I'm from. And it was government um, supported modern art. That's not what we're doing here. So I had to make sure that the industry standards that I hold are current. 
the technology is current. There's all kinds of new lighting technology, sound technology, custom technology, etc. So it has to be current. Otherwise, I'm not teaching them to succeed. I'm holding them back. I want them to be my competition. Um, the third one is their major requirements, concentrations, and emphasis. That's true of any college. Um, having a state-of-the-art facilities. <laughs> and then practica, right? They, it's not only theory. Even though with a, with a college of liberal arts, we want to make sure that in theater especially, they have uh, opportunities to exercise their muscle. And because it's 24-7. Oh, you like that custom? Guess what? Those 50 customs is 40 hours each. When are you going to build them? You want them that bad? Guess what? You're not sleeping for five weeks. <laughs> All right. Next one. Um, so for a curricular vision and mission, what I proposed to the faculty in my department, and they were already having this conversation, but when I interview, I wanted to make sure that we were on the same boat. Because if I wanted to come to UMass Boston, I wanted to make sure that what I had to offer is what they want me to do. Um, so I look at the regional theater model. The regional theater model offers layers of management, design, and production. It's not Broadway. It's, the no, it's not the for-profit sector. It's the next layer in the middle. It's not for-profit, but it's viable, and it, it offers paid positions, and it supports different agencies and unions. I'm not talking about community theater either. That's something that I probably would do when I retire. Next. So for those of you who are visual learners, that's what it looks like. Um, so you have a uh, director of, um, of theater, who is the big boss, and then you have a, they hire a director. Oh, wow, they're doing construction there. Um, and then you see different aspects. So all of these uh, in the different squares, there are teams of people that can be jobbed into a job. So in the regional theater, they are not necessarily full paid staff. Those people will be in the middle, like on the top. But if you see the, what I ran there on the, on the right side, on your right side, the circle, uh, that's the costume crew. Those are paid internships and um, good jobs. And so whenever I get a, a job, I take a team with me. And part of my negotiating is I have really good people. I have better the resumes. This is how much it costs. You understand? Um, next. OK, five minutes. Let's go. So curriculum, vision, and mission. We talked about the real theater model. Uh, industry standards, we look at different agencies, for example, for acting is the actor's equity. They give you rules for acting. How do you behave backstage? People think it's about being a star on stage. Really, 90% of your work is backstage. If you work well with others backstage, if you follow the rules, if you're not eating or smoking in your costume, if you're not like taking your wig off, throwing it on the floor and being a diva, stuff like that, you hear the stories, it doesn't work. There's no longevity on that. So knowing the backstage is much better. Also understand what are your rights. You have a right to a break every 45 minutes. You cannot wear a course for 10 hours when you're doing a technical rehearsal 10 out of 12. That'll kill you. So you know your rights. The same is true for custom designers. We work with actors, so we want to be able to protect their integrity and their interests. But we also, as designers, are OSHA compliant, so we're not going to use toxic things. They're going to kill the actor or me, um, et cetera. Next. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is for the people who are visual learners in the crowd. That's what those organizations look like. <laughs> Next. Um, at UMass, the, I love the major requirements that we have developed. There's a new curriculum. When I came into work here, I was so excited. It's a true liberal arts. We have history, script analysis, and current technology. In custom design, we focus on design, manufacturing, maintenance, and recycling. Because it's not just the design. You actually have to make the thing. You have to maintain it for the stage. And then you have to put it away so you can use it again and save a few bucks and then supervise in class applications. Next. Number four, state-of-the-art facilities. Woo! Woo right? And I'm telling you, I, I worked on another college that is around here. And we, I was part of the team that was starting all the new facilities. And this gap building has nothing to envy you. And I'm so psyched about it, because when students come to visit UMass Boston, we're going to be competition, and I'm all for it. But in the meantime, another thing that I'm really proud about, I'm being faculty, is that I got a research budget to start here where I was able to retrofit rooms into state-of-the-art places where I can teach. There is my lab where I do research with my students. Next slide. So this is a sample of a hands-on practica. Next slide. <laughs> yeah. So this is a sample, 12th night. Last spring, 
Um, uh, we did a wonderful production of Twelve Night and uh, Shakespeare's comedy. And uh, the director wanted to place the play uh, at the Balkans, uh, Illyria. Um, um, so it was in a coastal town in the Byzantine 13, 1400 time. And we brought a costume from that production. We chose silks for this. Oh. We chose. They can project, too. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> we chose silks for this costume because Constantinople, or modern-day Turkey, um, was a hub of trade and was a destination on the Silk Route coming from Asia. And the sleeveless tunic right there is called a tabard, and it was worn by men back then. <laughs> the fabrics are nature-based um, from about the Asian culture around that time, where this would have been from. Oh, it's my turn. <laughs> OK. Uh, another thing you're going to notice, because we talk about Illyria, this is where Constantinople is now, but Illyria is in the coastal area. And it was th these people were in a shipwreck, so we used the sand and the water as part of our color choices. And then we brought those colors into this felt cape that we put on to give it a page boy look. Women used to dress as boys to be able to go on the street. And uh, you can see the sketch on the right side. So these students actually were able to apply their concentration and pr work on these costumes. We built costumes. You can see two of our actors in the back if you want to look at them. It's Alicia Modeste and Jonas Marucas. They have been performing the whole time. Come forward. And you can see some items we built from scratch, some items actually we found, and then we retrofit them to serve our purposes. Yes. Cool. Um, they were stopped early on because, and they were asked, are you really part of this event? Some big cop. And they were like, shit, you went performing arts. It's <laughs> those theater people. Um, so I mentioned the Kennedy Center earlier. They came to see our show, and we had to receive a merit, merit mention for the custom construction. Now, I'm a really proud papa because this was my second semester, and these students actually made this happen for us. So now, I have a few more minutes, I think. So if you allow me, I'm going to go into the professional gig. Uh, so all these students um, work with me. So um, um, when they ask, do I need a portfolio resume? Yes. Damn it, you do. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm not going to present this part because that's a separate workshop. OK? But I'm just going to plant the seed for the future. So I may speak, have another talk at UMass, and you can all come see it. People pay me a lot of money to do this around the country. So. <laughs> You know. <laughs> so the resume, the only thing I had to say to people in theater, you need to take workshops on how to do a traditional resume, and then you had to make some choices because people in the business read it differently. So here, when you do a, a theater resume, you have to live with technical experience if you want to be a technician. If you want to be a designer, you live with design studios. Uh, design experience, articulate. Um, you don't live with, like, your classroom and your goals. That's not how they read it. They're like, boring, done, OK? They're like, I need to get the job done. Um, add special skills, right? You may say, well, I'm a makeup artist, and I actually do open Photoshop. That's a fabulous skill, because you can manipulate the picture and actually give a picture to the actor. Say, this is what I want you to do. You understand? And then least reputable work size. That's the most important thing. Start working in size that you know if somebody sees them, they can say, oh, you work there? Like, for example, Annie Ross, she's one of the dancers at the Donkey Show at the American Repertory Theater. If you don't know what the American Repertory Theater is, let me tell you two things. Diane Paulos and like three or four Tony Awards in the last two years, OK? <laughs> the portfolio, I tell the students in design technology, and these kids, their iPhones are filled with pictures. <laughs> Take pictures of all your work so you have an archive. Uh, then you start planning your print layout. You can use something as basic as Photoshop. And then you can get a free website like Wix.com, et cetera, and start working your portfolio. You can print that, and then you have a book, and then you can go to an interview. That's the quickly. Can I get a paying job? Hell yeah. <laughs> OK, so if you apprentice with a recognized or renowned artist, they will recommend you. So I tell you, you want to be a makeup artist? Call Joe Rossi, Ryan, Rhode Island. He's done every film that comes to town. He's doing all these great TV shows. He knows every A-lister. I work with him. 
He's fabulous. And he takes students under his wing. All right? Next thing you know, you can be in the union. And then you can get, you know, you go from 10 to 17 to $25 an hour. You get double time and triple time. Do the math. 24-7 in a film. <laughs> All right? I want that job. Um, <laughs> Then if you have those side, those uh, places where people recognize them, right, and you work with apprentice with somebody who is also recognized in the industry, you can apply for a choice internship. If somebody want to be a first hand or a draper or a tailor, I always tell them, like, your higher uh, assistantship in theater is at the Santa Fe Opera. They pay you really well. You work with, with people from the Lincoln Center, et cetera. You just do the summer. And sometimes they even allow you to design for the smaller operas for the students there. And it's a beautiful site. Uh, there's many others. And then you can also apply for freelance jobs. In Boston, we have such a vibrant regional theater. I keep getting calls all the time. Do you have a student you can recommend? I only recommend them if I know they're up to the standard and the, and the rigors, because if I stamp it with my name, they have a high expectation. Uh, if they don't look good, it sucks for me, so I'm not going to do it. So don't be calling me if I don't know you. Um, OK, so we, we are going to wrap this up. My assistant, she's so good. I love her. Uh, so, uh, I, um, right now, the Lyric Stage Company of Boston in the Back Bay, they produce, uh, they do about eight shows a year. Um, they won every award locally, Ernie Awards, Norton, whatever. They're fabulous. They've got every grant. I love working with them because they're into supporting local talent. It's one of the only regional theaters that does that. They don't go to New York. they from here. And they actually um, uh, audition students. And if they have potential, they'll, they'll take a chance. That is, for me, diversity and inclusiveness. You take a freaking chance, you know? It's not about just selling the ticket. Um, so um, I got this gig. Sweeney taught demo, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street. And when I was in the negotiating process, they really wanted me there. And I said, I want to so, bring some of my students to be the costume shop. OK. So we started the negotiating. And it's like, I'm betting them. It's like, your word is great. You say they go, they go. So they did. They worked with me. We produced 41 costumes. About 300 pieces, Victoriana, uh, Penny Dreadful um, in London. Uh, this is some images just to tease you. The show is still going on. It's being sold out every night. They do have student rush, and my students got comps and everything. Um, it's been a huge success. Success. What I'm the happiest about when people go there, and they see my bio that I change jobs, but they also see my students are actually listed in a separate page as custom assistants. And there's a big thing that says, thank you, UMass Boston. Thank you. Great. Questions for Rafael or mm -hmm. his students, please? I'd note that uh, another differentiating characteristic of UMass Boston is how supportive our students are of one another. Yes, they are. <laughs> Questions, recipes? Yes. Come on over. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, you mean like in a professional gig? Correct. Come on over. <laughs> you interview with me. We look at your potential. We look at your resume. You never know where it's going to take you. The first step, you have to show up. You understand? I came to this country because I showed up. I, I grew up in the ghettos of Caracas, Venezuela. I'm, I'm like many students at UMass. And I was working doing theater because I loved it, but no, because I thought it was a career choice. And then I had one mentor who said, you know what? Do you have a portfolio? I said, yeah, I save all my stuff. Let's organize it. And then he said, we're going to apply for a grant for you. And I went along not knowing what the hell he was talking about. I just did it. I showed up. I said, I'm going to dress you up. Don't tell them where you come from, the ghetto, because Venezuela was very social, conscious, you know, whatever. Um, so I did my thing, right? And next thing I know, it's like, OK, you got the grant, but you need to, to be admitted in one of the Ivy schools or a choice school in, in America. So I applied to New York University. I did, this is me not knowing nothing. I just applied. They accepted me. Next thing I know, I was in New York. This is in 81. I'm still here. We're still in my dream, the American dream, et cetera. So, you know. And we're glad you're at UMass Boston. Yeah. Oh, one more person. I was just wondering if any of the students would like to s talk about why they chose UMass Boston. Yes. Well, 
one reason why um, I currently love being at, at UMass Boston, especially in the theater department, is they are very focused on getting you from the classroom to the job. I feel like a lot of, there's the stereotype about the theater major, you know, starving artist, you'll never find a job, you'll never get paid. But I really feel like that's not true for our theater department. And if you put in the work and the time, the professors are invested in you and will put in the work to help you find a job, which is great. I'm actually from Florida, so my main goal was to get out of Florida. <laughs> <laughs> And I actually have family members who went to UMass Boston, but not in theater. But I knew that theater was what I wanted to do. But when I got here for Welcome Day, I heard a lot about how the theater program was growing and expanding, and that really, really interested me. And luckily, I got in. So that's how I ended up here. <laughs> We're glad all of you are here. Another round of applause for these beautiful people and for Professor Raphael Hayen. Thank you.